Well, thanks to all of you for coming out here tonight. Um, this visit has an enormous amount of personal resonance for me uh, because it was about, I was trying to remember, and my middle-aged brain is having trouble, it was five or six years ago that I came here for the first time and I met with Skip Rutherford and I met with Senator Pryor and I started trying to figure out what really happened in Damascus, Arkansas. And I'll tell you how I came to write about it. After I wrote Fast Food Nation, I was invited by the Air Force to visit some of their most top secret bases. I became interested in the future of warfare in space. And I was able to visit bases that I think no civilian or journalist uh, would be able to visit today. And I talked to members of the Air Force Space Command and the U.S. Space Command about the threat to our space assets, what would happen if someone attacked our satellites, commercial and military. They gave me demonstrations of some of their newest uh, potential weapons, directed energy, laser weapons. Um, but what I got most interested in talking to these officers who were my hosts were nuclear weapons because many of the people who served in the Air Force Space Command had originally been uh, members of launch crews, uh, ballistic missile launch crews. And they began telling me stories of the Cold War, which had ended peacefully, thankfully. And one of them told me the story about the accident in Damascus, Arkansas. What happened, how the Air Force tried to co cope with it, and it, it seemed to be an extraordinary story. And coincidentally, I happened to be visiting Vandenberg Air Force Base, and it just so happened that they were launching a Titan II missile while I was there. And I really wanted the opportunity to see that happen. So I signed the waiver, saying I wouldn't sue the Air Force if something went wrong. And I was trained in the use of a Scott Air Pack and my host, who had been at Vandenberg for many years, had never stood that close to a missile being launched. And you know, part of me was thinking, well, is this just a convenient way to get rid of this journalist? <laughs> but it was one of the most spectacular things I've ever seen in my life. This was the largest ballistic missile that we built, about the size of a 10-story building, silver, massive. I was able to stand right next to it. It wasn't being launched from a silo. It was being launched from a tower with a weather satellite on it. I was able to stand right next to it and almost touch it. And it just was an extraordinary thing. One of the things that struck me was how unbelievably courageous the Gemini astronauts were. Because men sat in a little capsule on top of just that kind of rocket and went up into orbit. And the next day when that thing launched, you could hear it, you could feel it, and suddenly the silver 10-story building was flying up into the sky. There was a moment when it first started to take off, there was just a slight hesitation, and then it was gone. And you could see it and Vandenberg is along the central coast of California, you could see it in the sky when it was already over Mexico. And it really affected me, because I had grown up in the Cold War. And we had grown up with a fear of nuclear war as part of our daily life. And part of me, maybe the cynic in me, always thought, well, if it ever comes to that, are these things going to really work? This missile worked. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary sight. So after that, I visited uh, one of the airmen who had played a central role in trying to save the missile in Damascus. And he told me a great deal about what happened. And I decided to write a very thin, short book that would give you a minute-by-minute -minute description of the accident, the effort to save the missile, and the aftermath, based in Arkansas. 
And I, I partly had that in mind when I came here five or six years ago. But the more I learned about the management of our nuclear weapons during the Cold War, the bigger the book got. And a parallel narrative in this book, there are, there are two really central narratives. One is the story of this accident, and the other is the story of America's nuclear weapons designers, literally, from 1945, when the very first nuclear device was detonated in Alamogordo, New Mexico, almost to this present day, their effort to control our nuclear weapons. And when I say control, I mean make sure they go off when they're supposed to, make sure they never go off by accident, they're never stolen, they're never sabotaged, they're never used by personnel within our own chain of command who aren't authorized to use them. And it was an extraordinary challenge throughout the Cold War to do that because you wanted to have these weapons available for immediate use against the Soviets if war came and they needed to be reliable. You didn't want an American bomber pilot to fly all the way to the Soviet Union risking his life and then drop a weapon that was a dud. But at the same time you wanted to make sure that these weapons never went off accidentally, never were used by unauthorized personnel, never could be used uh, or sabotaged or stolen. And there was this tension from the very first nuclear weapon um, between always, always available, always going to work, and never, never detonate accidentally. And one of the things I learned, which is one of the things that made this a much bigger book and that I think uh, is of relevance to everyone who lives in Arkansas, is that the W-53 warhead, which was on that Titan II missile, had already raised concerns at the weapons labs. And you would never put a warhead on a missile today with the safety mechanisms that were on that warhead in September of 1980. And it's 33 years ago this week. So for those of you who are young, and were born, thankfully, after the Cold War. I'll give you just a brief, brief description of what happened. The Titan II missile relied on two propellants, two different chemicals that were stored in different tanks. One was a fuel, the other was an oxidizer that contained the oxygen for the fuel when it was flying through space. And through pipes, these two different fuels would go, and the moment that they would hit, they would ignite. And that's what would propel the missile up into space towards the Soviet Union. And these chemicals were extremely toxic, extremely lethal, and extremely, in the case of the fuel, explosive. So they had to be handled very carefully. And uh, one day, there was somebody doing routine maintenance on a Titan II missile, not really a huge problem, sort of like adding a little more air to your tire before a long road trip. There was a slight pressure problem in one of the tanks. And keep in mind that this fuel and this oxidizer was so lethal that the men who worked in the silo had to wear special suits that looked like a space suit with a bubble helmet and an air pack so that none of this, none of the propellants would touch their skin or would be inhaled by them. And he was about to screw this pressure cap and the socket fell off of his wrench. Now it was a big socket. It's about a nine pound socket. And it fell off his wrench and it bounced on the steel work platform he was working on. And he grabbed for it, and he missed. And the socket fell through this very narrow gap between the steel platform and the missile. And the socket fell about 70 feet towards the bottom of the silo. It bounced off part of the silo, and it hit the missile, 
and it tore a hole in the metal skin of the missile and thousands of gallons of rocket fuel began pouring into the silo. And this missile had been on alert for many years, about 17 years since the Titan II had gone on alert. Nothing like this had happened before. And the Air Force was confronted with a situation that there was no precedent for dealing with. And they had the most powerful nuclear warhead ever put on an American missile on top of this missile. There were all kinds of challenges that people had to figure out that night. Do we keep the silo clo door closed? The silo door weighed about 150,000 pounds. It was made out of concrete. In case the Soviets attacked us, it would protect the missile so that the missile could then be fired back at the Soviets. So one question was, do we open the silo door? And if we open the silo door, some of the fuel vapor that's accumulating might be released and there'll be less likelihood of an explosion. But if you open the silo door and there is an explosion, then you have no idea where this nuclear warhead's going to go. If you keep the silo door closed, you can probably contain it and keep track of it. There were so many questions that had to be decided that night about what to do, whether to get the launch crew out of their underground control center to keep them safe, or whether to keep them in there so that they could monitor the equipment, uh, whether to put technicians back into the site to try to save the missile. And the reason that I wound up writing about the Damascus accident at such length is to me, it's not only an amazing story, it's a story of extraordinary personal courage and heroism of the airmen who were on that site. But it's also a story that illustrates, I think, very well the difficulty of controlling complex technological systems. And I came to see that we're much, much better at creating them than we are at controlling them. And I had trouble getting to Little Rock today because I was in Atlanta and the plane went, went onto the runway and was getting ready to take off and aborted the takeoff. And then the pilot got on apologetically and said, we've just had a minor computer glitch in the cockpit. And my book is full of glitches like that. <laughs> now, when a commercial airliner has that kind of glitch and tragically crashes and tragically there are victims, there will probably be two or three hundred at the most. And one commercial airliner, a Swiss Air airliner, was probably brought down because there was a short circuit in the entertainment system, in the seats. Very complex, complex systems. Well, when you think of machines, nuclear weapons are the most dangerous machines that we've ever built. And when nuclear weapons are mated to weapon systems like missiles or bombers, they become even more complex. And then when they're mated to early warning systems and computer systems, they become even more complex. Throughout the Cold War, we probably built a total of about 70,000 American nuclear weapons. At one point, the United States had 32,000 in the mid-60s. To my knowledge, not one of those 70,000 nuclear weapons that we built detonated accidentally, was used without authorization, or was ever stolen. That's an extraordinary success rate. It speaks to our technological competence. It also speaks to the personal courage and heroism of so many people who served in the Cold War. And one of the themes of my book is looking at nuclear weapons not from the point of view of the National Security Advisor like Kissinger 
or the arms control, you know, there's so many books written about Oppenheimer and Teller and the Cold War scientists. I wanted to write a book that told the lives of the launch officers, the bomber crew officers, the missile repairmen, uh, the weapons designer who's working on the nuts and bolts. I interviewed for the book a guy who at the age of 1920 was an explosive ordnance demolition technician he was a bomb squad guy. And if there was a damaged nuclear weapon, it was the responsibility of him and people like him to go over to it and defuse it. And that takes some nerve. So I write about accidents, but I also write about the extraordinary heroism that prevented not only a nuclear catastrophe here, but in other places in this country. Um, and we forget, particularly people who weren't born yet during the Cold War, that American servicemen risked their lives and lost their lives in order to deter a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And it was our nuclear strength that helped to ensure there never was one of those nuclear wars. But now that the Cold War is over, and now that these documents are available for the Freedom of Information Act, we need to confront the reality of nuclear weapons and the threat they still pose at this present moment. Because I go through the technical expertise of the guys at Sandia and Los Alamos and how they were able to come up with all of these safety mechanisms. But now you have Pakistan. Now you have India. You may have Iran with nuclear weapons. And if you look at the rate of industrial accidents in Pakistan and Iran and India, these are machines that you don't want to have in these hands. Uh, Iraq did have a nuclear weapons program. And when the UN inspectors went into Iraq after the first Gulf War, they were able to look at some of the plans for the Iraqi nuclear weapons. And one of the UN inspectors said that if that warhead had fallen off of a table, it could have detonated because of how poorly it was designed. So it took me a long time to accumulate this information. I spent as much time as I could with people who handled nuclear weapons in a day-to-day -day sense. And the book is very much about the challenge of managing our nuclear arsenal in a day-to-day -day way. And I think it offers a very, very important lesson about this technology and uh, the respect that we need to show for it. One of the concerns that I have right now, and I don't want to talk too long and I'd love to take questions, is the Titan II missile uh, was supposed to be retired around 1967 or 1968 because we had a new type of missile, the Minuteman missile, that used a solid fuel that was much less dangerous, much less toxic, much easier to manage. But after the Vietnam War, uh, there were all kinds of cutbacks in military spending. There was an enormous amount of disillusion in our military and disrespect for the military in our culture and an underinvestment in spare parts, in all kinds of basic infrastructure in the Air Force. Uh, by the mid-1970s, we had lots of trouble uh, getting our fighter planes off the ground in any large proportion. And the Titan II suffered as a result. Uh, by 1980, there were shortages of spare parts. There were frequent leaks from this, these corrosive uh, propellants. These suits, these uh, like space suits that the uh, technicians had to wear frequently had to be patched. Studies were showing that they were obsolete. Uh, the air pack was designed to last an hour, but on the night of the, uh, the Damascus accident, uh, they only could trust that it would have a half hour of air. 
And young men, and I'm amazed at how young, when you look back, 22, 23, 24 year old guys risking their lives, I think, were not being given adequate equipment and were asked to do things that put them in greater jeopardy than they should have been. Today, our land-based missile, the Minuteman III, was first introduced in 1970. A lot of the infrastructure of those silos and launch complexes was built in the early and mid-1960s. Our primary nuclear bomber is the B-52. The B-52 was designed after the Second World War and there, have not, there has not been a brand new B-52 since 1962. So one of the things that I hope my book will precipitate in this country is a public discussion. How many nuclear weapons should we have? How would we use them? Where should they be aimed? And how should they be deployed? Missiles, submarines, bombers, I think people in good faith can debate all these issues. Some people think we should have 500, some people think we should have 1,500 or 2,000. Um, but what I think unquestionably is that if we're gonna have these weapons, the most powerful and destructive weapons ever made by man, we must spare no expense in how we maintain them, in how we train the people who handle them, uh, make sure they are well compensated, make sure the morale is high. This summer, two of our three Minuteman strategic wings um, were cited for serious safety violations. Our largest uh, storage facility for the Air Force's nuclear weapons at Kirtland Air Force Base, the whole squadron was decertified a few years ago for safety violations. And I don't think things are anywhere near as bad as they were in the late 1960s and the 1970s when there were high rates of illegal drug use uh, in our military. But after the Iraq and Afghanistan campaigns, uh, there's a similar sort of um, disillusion setting in. There are budget cutbacks that I think are going to affect our nuclear enterprise in a way that concerns me. And for years, the whole subject of nuclear weapons hasn't really been discussed in the United States except for other people's nuclear weapons. And we need to discuss ours. It is miraculous, truly, that more people weren't hurt that night in Damascus. Through some fluke, that enormous 150,000 pound silo door, when the missile blew, was thrown more than 200 yards. Think about how far, how big a football field is. Think about an object 150,000 pounds. It was blown toward the west. Most of the debris was blown, blown toward the west. And the Air Force personnel were mainly on the highway to the east. A young uh, serviceman was killed. A couple of dozen were injured. But, and I write about it in the book, and I spoke to weapons designers about it, there was a chance, there was a possibility, low probability, still a possibility, that that warhead could have detonated. And if it had detonated, the course of American history would have been changed. So we made it through the Cold War without a major city being destroyed by a nuclear weapon. The Soviet Union vanished from the face of the earth. The Berlin Wall vanished. It is incredible that all of that could happen without thousands of people being killed. When I was growing up, it was unimaginable the Soviet Union would vanish without a war. But we can't just assume that our good fortune will last. And the point of my book is to remind people of the dangers, show people how close we came to disaster on a number of occasions and honor the veterans and the servicemen who served in the Cold War. I tell many of their stories uh, because they've never gotten a memorial in the way that Vietnam veterans have and the Korean uh, veterans and Second World War veterans. 
And I think enough time has passed now that we can appreciate their service. So, having said that, I'd love any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got lots of questions, so we'll, we'll wait for the microphones to get there. Gary, right here. Wait for your microphone. There, there you go. Yeah, what uh, was the uh, damage assessment if the warhead had actually exploded? What, I mean, what could we have expected to see today as a result of that? The closest approximation was there was a test of one of our early hydrogen bombs. Uh, it was a device that would most mimic the kind we would use in an air carried bomb. And it was nicknamed Shrimp. This is in 1954, I think. They expected that it would be five megatons. And when they detonated it, they had done their calculations wrong. And the explosion just got bigger and bigger and bigger. I write about it in the book. Scientists who were 20 miles away from the detonation were trapped in their bunker. And their bunker was a concrete bunker that was moving as though the earth had been turned into jelly. That turned out to be a 15 megaton weapon. The one on this uh, missile was nine megaton. They calculate that that would have created lethal fallout over a 6,000 square mile area. That if you detonated that weapon over Washington, D.C., and the population couldn't get shelter in like fallout shelters, as much, of, as much as half the population of New York City would be killed by lethal fallout. If a nine megaton weapon detonated over Arkansas, this state would have been consumed by firestorms. The, the, the fireball itself would have probably been about three miles wide, just the fireball. And large parts of the state would have been uninhabitable for many, many years. And again, the debris from the missile explosion providentially went in the direction away from the Air Force personnel. So you just can't count on that happening every time. Now, what were the odds of that weapon detonating in that accident? Uh, the weapons, I, I interviewed one of the, wep one of the weapons designers who helped design that weapon. <coughs> He said, uh, it was improbable, but not impossible. And that scared them, because the Titan II technicians who I spoke to said that things were dropping in the silo all the time. Tools dropped. Things dropped all the time, and they never pierced a missile. And one guy said, if you had stood there with that socket, and tried to throw it because of the configuration underneath the missile where there was a W. If you had tried to get that ricochet, you couldn't have pierced that missile. So improbable things happen. And I'll just finish up this answer. One of the most, again, complex technological systems, unpredictable events, out of control. There was a B-52 bomber flying with four hydrogen bombs. And it was on a long mission. And one of the crew members wanted to be comfortable on this long flight. And he brought four foam rubber cushions with him to lie on. He stowed the rubber seat cushions beneath the seat on the bomber, inadvertently put it next to a heat vent. Halfway into the flight, the rubber seat cushions caught on fire. The cockpit, the cockpit filled with smoke. There was a desperate attempt put out the fire. And this bomber was flying near one of our most important top secret military installations in Thule, Greenland. They tried to make an emergency landing at Thule, and they couldn't. But the pilot was able to just guide the plane away from the air base before the crew bailed out. A heroic thing, because he stayed on that plane a long time. The hydrogen bombs detonated but didn't give a full-scale detonation. They just contaminated the Arctic with plutonium. But who would ever imagine, 
Who would ever imagine that a B-52 bomber could conceivably destroy one of our top secret, most important radar installations because of four seat cushions? And this is why we need to have real humility when we create dangerous, high consequence, complex technological systems. Sean, right here, right here. Hi, Mr. Schlosser. My name is Sean, and I'm a student here. Uh, could you tell us about the role that Dean Rutherford and Senator Pryor played in the story that you tell? Because we've heard a few stories, too, and they're very good. So maybe you could share that with the audience. Yeah. Well, I want you to know that I'm fallible, like these machines, and there may be mistakes in my book. And I hope people point them out. But I did have it carefully fact-checked. So what I'm about to tell you about the senator and Skip has been verified. Uh, there was someone who was present when Senator Pryor visited a Titan II site. And that Air Force uh, enlisted men knew that the toxic vapor detector at the site wasn't working that day. And he had become concerned for a while about some of the problems with the Titan II. And he felt ordinary servicemen were being jeopardized by a dangerous weapon system. But when he saw a US senator be potentially put into a dangerous situation, he decided something had to be done and contacted Skip, who was a 29-year-old legislative aide. And a series of meetings began in which concerns about the safety about the age, about the absence of spare parts, uh, were shared with Skip and with Senator Pryor. So Senator Pryor contacted the Secretary of the Air Force with these concerns, was dismissed. No problem, weapons systems perfectly safe. So Senator Pryor came up with a radical, radical, radical proposal. He wanted there to be warning sirens put at every Titan II site in case there was a fuel leak or an oxidizer leak that could threaten the neighboring population because this same site in Damascus had had an oxidizer leak that had killed a bunch of cattle, sickened people, and that missile silo was not that far from an elementary school. So Senator Pryor came up with this radical, un-American proposal <laughs> of having sirens. And the Air Force strongly opposed that idea because having a siren go off, they argued, might cause panic in the nearby population. <laughs> As it should. But Senator Pryor was persistent and was able to get funding for warning sirens around the Titan II sites, but unfortunately, I think it was two days before this accident, and there were none in place. And the Air Force just wasn't prepared for this accident. The security police officers who were responding to the accident didn't have maps of the area during the evacuation. And this is by no means a criticism of the security police officers. One of the heroes of my book is an officer named Don Green, who was just driving along, heard about this detonation, and risked his life to try to save young airmen whom he'd never met. Uh, and again and again, there were stories of heroism. So Skip and Senator Pryor really tried to do the right thing and the responsible thing, but they were stonewalled by the Air Force and by the Carter administration. At that point in the Cold War, the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan. Uh, we had canceled our visit to the Summer Olympics, and there was a great deal of international stress. It didn't seem like the best time, perhaps, to admit that there were problems with one of our strategic missiles. But by not admitting the problems, um, we made them more dangerous. Yes, ma'am, right here. Yeah. 
From 1983 to 88, my husband and I lived in Grand Forks, North Dakota, which was one of the two stack missile bases, and we were about five miles from there. And they also had more underground missile silos there than most other places, to the point where if we had seceded from the United States, North Dakota, I think, was supposed to have been the third largest nuclear power in the world. <laughs> but they were connected by underground cables to NORAD and Cheyenne Mountain, and periodically farmers would accidentally cut a cable. It was set off an auto launch sequence. And they had to send crews from Cheyenne Mountain up to North Dakota to check the site, make sure it wasn't terrorism versus just a farmer cutting a cable. And we also lived in the same apartment building with the SAC missile crew. They came home all dejected one day with, what's wrong? Well, they had flown their plane up, I think, to the North Pole and back landed and dropped their payload on the tarmac accidentally, but the missiles weren't armed. So, yeah. you know, nothing happened, thank goodness. So I don't know if people realize how many underground silos there are all over the country. One of the most serious nuclear weapons accidents occurred at Grand Forks, and it occurred the same week as the Damascus accident. Uh, a B-52 bomber with four hydrogen bombs and eight short-range missiles with nuclear warheads, uh, one of its engines caught on fire. And it was because of the direction the plane was parked uh, and the fact that there was a 35 mile an hour strong gale wind that the flames were blown away from the fuselage of the plane, uh, away from the bomb bay, and the fire crew just sat there next to the runway spraying the plane with foam, but they couldn't put out the fire for over two hours, almost three hours, because it was being fed by all the fuel on the bomber. And in the book I write about a fire inspector. He wasn't even a fireman. He was a fire inspector who was quite familiar with B-52 bombers because he had worked at Castle Air Force Base in California. He volunteered in the middle of the night to climb onto the bomber and try to shut off the fuel going to that engine. He had two small children. He climbed into the bomber in the middle of the night, found the right switch, and the, the reason they asked him to do this is because the paint was beginning, to, the fuselage was beginning to blister from the heat, and the hydrogen bombs on that plane were bombs that the weapons labs were especially concerned about, the Mark 28 bomb. This guy climbed onto the bomber, flicked the right switch, the flames went out as though someone had shut off a stove. But I mean, it was just extraordinary. His name is Tim Griffiths. Extraordinary personal heroism that was recognized by the Air Force, but not by the public at all when that occurred. OK, let's see. Yes, sir, right here. We'll, we'll, we, got, we'll, we have a lot of questions, and we'll take them. You've spoken in, your, in the book as well very highly of the uh, listed personnel who, who all over the country, but the book leaves a much less favorable impression of the, of the Air Force people in charge. Uh, do you think that situation would be the same today, or do you think the, the Air Force people seem, the people in charge seem not to know what to do this whole night they spent on the telephones and then also their secrecy? Do you think that's, uh, could you relate the anecdote, by the way, of the phone call that uh, Vice President Mondale made from Hot Springs to the Secretary of Defense? But also, do, you think these, do you think the command situation would be as, uh, as uh, what we say, muddled today as, it, as you uh, convey it having been back then? I would say uh, that the caliber of the leadership in the Air Force changes with time in the same way that the caliber of the leadership in the White House does. It's not a static thing. One of the people who I came away with a lot of respect for, an unlikely person for me to write favorably about because of my own political views, was General Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay was an officer who put his men at great risk, but was willing to be in the lead plane when they were at greatest risk. He was willing to put himself in the most dangerous position during the Second World War on bombing runs to demonstrate to his men that he was with them. And as a, as a commander, he did everything he could to protect the lives of the men who served with him. I think that the leadership of the Air Force around the Damascus accident was very different. 
again and again there were efforts to blame the people at the bottom for problems that were really due to systemic problems that were really due to management issues and uh, one of Curtis LeMay's um, policies was you know if there was an accident or a problem he fired the guys at the top and uh, when we had six thermonuclear weapons go missing for a day and a half in 2007 uh, at Minot Air Force Base where they were removed from a bunker nobody signed for them, no one realized they were taking nuclear warheads on cruise missiles out of there they were flown across the United States, parked on a runway for a day and a half we didn't realize that we were missing half a dozen uh, thermonuclear warheads uh, Bob Gates who was Secretary of Defense he channeled the spirit of Curtis LeMay, he fired the people at the top and um, you know, ultimately, it's sort of, if there are issues of misbehavior, if there are people who aren't following rules, if there are shortcuts being taken, then you can blame the people at the bottom who are doing that, but it's truly a management problem that, that begins at the top. So I'm very critical of the Air Force and how they handled this accident. One of the most heroic people that night uh, was given a letter of reprimand and uh, once everyone else was outraged by that he was given a medal <laughs> and I think quite honestly if I had been in charge in the Air Force I would have given him the medal and I would have waited a few months and then I would have given him the reprimand <laughs> but, but they, 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 there was a constant effort to blame the little guy there was an accident in Rock, Kansas in which two people died at a Titan II missile complex because there was one of these propellant leaks. One of the guys who was severely injured was completely untrained for the job he was supposed to be doing. He had literally never worked on a Titan II complex in his life. This was his first day on the job when the accident happened. He had nothing to do with the accident and the Air Force tried to hold him responsible. And that's the antithesis of the sort of leadership that Curtis LeMay showed. Again, I disagree with some of Curtis LeMay's politics. I disagree with some of his nuclear strategy. But I think he was one of the most influential and extraordinary military leaders we've had because he created this esprit de corps and he really led his men to believe that, you know, he would do everything he could for them and that he would, you know, lose his own life with them if need be. Yes, I totally forgot about that part of the question. Uh, the Air Force was determined as the Damascus accident was unfolding that they would not reveal if there was a nuclear weapon involved. And it was sort of, it made a bad situation a thousand times worse because it seemed obvious there was a nuclear weapon involved. And, uh, you know, they were saying we will not confirm nor deny that there's a nuclear weapon involved. So it just so happened that Vice President Mondale was here in Hot Springs for the State Democratic Convention and uh, he wanted to know if there was a nuclear weapon involved. <laughs> and he was on the phone with the uh, Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, and Harold Brown seemed reluctant to tell him and Vice President Mondale said, God damn it, I'm the Vice President of the United States, Harold, was there a nuclear warhead? And then he found out that there was. <laughs> uh, just, just to say, I was there. Uh, I was there, I don't know, it may have been dawn or uh, two, I don't know what time it was, Skip, we'd gotten to the Arlington Hotel, I'll make this very quick. But here was, uh, here, I, here we were standing just like this, and here was the Vice President of the United States, Walter Mondale, who was about to make a speech to the Democratic Convention later that morning. And he was on the phone with Harold Brown, the Secretary of Defense in Washington, and it was like blankety blank, Harold, I'm Vice President of the United States, was there a nuclear warhead on that missile or not? You know, it was pretty profane. And finally, Harold Brown said, yes, there was. But I'll tell you what, it's interesting because when Harry Truman 
became President of the United States, succeeding Franklin D. Roosevelt, the beloved and giant Franklin D. Roosevelt. Harry S. Truman, who had been a U.S. Senator and who was Vice President, who had just been sworn in, asked a question. He said, what is this bomb I keep hearing about that they've been making out west? Well, that was Los Alamos, that was Oppenheimer, and Harry Truman, the Vice President, had never had a briefing about the nuclear bomb, that we, the atomic bomb that we were, we were making. So it's a, it's a strange world up there and in all of this, and I'd like to encourage our students to do something. This will be much more meaningful to you, and this, I want, I want to say something about Eric, and this will all be much more meaningful to you, all of you, whether you're students or whatever. Get in the car someday or get on the airplane, fly into Santa Fe or Albuquerque, get in the car and drive up to Alamos. I've been there three times, Los Alamos, I should say. And I'll tell you, that world is a world that we knew nothing about. Absolutely, the public, the citizens knew nothing about that world. The books on Oppenheimer are some of the most mm -hmm. fascinating mm -hmm. that I've ever read, and I hope that you will uh, read those. And finally, let me say something. I remember one time, Skip, during that evening or that morning, it was all a blur now, I got this call. This call, and I had been in the news because I had just been in this issue we had of the, of the warning system, and so people started calling me. They didn't know who else to call. Prior Arkansas, you know, he's been involved, so I started getting all these phone calls, no cell phones, of course. And I got all these calls. One I remember was from a little radio person in Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> and she said, Senator Pryor, when this bomb, when this nuclear accident occurred, did it clog up the subway system in Damascus? <laughs> I said it's over. That's funny. She had no idea what we were talking about. But I want to say this. We spend an awful lot of time in, within these walls right here in Little Rock, Arkansas, in the Clinton School of Public Service, trying to find a definition, trying to define what public service really is. And it's hard. One person's idea of public service is not the next person's idea. Let me say in conclusion that what Eric has done here with this book, to me, epitomizes one of the greatest acts of what I would call public service that's been rendered in a very, very long time. And we thank you for doing it. There's a gentleman back there raising his hand that I remember talking to in 1980. Yes, sir. Tell him your story. Well, I just wanted to say thanks to Eric for uh, writing about, I was the guy that went and visited with them back in 1979 uh, in October. And the outcome was I got my PRP poll, which is a personal reliability profile by the Air Force. And as a master technician and a master team chief, I served coffee for the last six weeks I was in the Air Force. Um, oh, too, too far away? Okay. So anyway, I just wanted to say thanks for writing the book. Uh, these are things that during lightning storms living in Jacksonville, I would find myself standing up in bed with the sheets around me because it was that close. We lived it every day. And... Uh, Whenever they, whenever they waltzed you guys out to 3-6 without any protection whatsoever, I thought, well, I know I'm just expendable, but is the United States Senator really expendable? And so we had a six-man team, maintenance team. We worked uh, electronics on the missiles, and we knew those, those systems. And so uh, I gathered up my crew, and I took the maintenance book that showed that the senator was exposed to whatever was out there on that day with no idea what it could have been. And uh, told my boss I was going, and that way uh, the other five guys had a chance of not being discovered. And so they made my life hell for about uh, 
just six weeks. <laughs> and then I was in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, uh, driving down the highway on my way to, uh, to college. Uh, my little GI Bill after I got out, after I got my associate's degree at BB. And uh, I heard on the radio, September 1980. And I pulled the car over, and my knees shook for probably three minutes. And then I found out later some of my friends were dead, or one of my friends was dead, and one of them walked with a cane for the rest of his life. But it was, it was that real to us, uh, and we knew what was at risk. We knew what those weapons would do. And we had to deal with everybody's grandma in the grocery store in Guy, Arkansas, thanking you for your service and making Arkansas safe. And I, 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 had, I couldn't tell them, ma'am, I'm making you the biggest target in this part of the United States. <laughs> the Russians never heard of Guy, Arkansas until we put nine megatons of fun out here. But anyway, I wanted, can, can Ken say something? Ken was on staff at, at uh, SAC. Uh, I was uh, on Titan crew from 74 to 79, and I had just left uh, Arkansas, went up to SAC, and was in the command post during that operation when Levitt was there. But my question is, the title of your book, Command and Control, can you comment? I was there when they were switching over, when they were first putting the coded switches on, on the Titans, and prior to that, there was no coded switch. Can you comment about that, that command and control, when there was very little locking mechanism on the missile itself and could actually could have been launched by a couple of crew members who yeah. knew what they were doing. Can you yeah. comment on that? Yeah. Uh, it's almost like if you think about the James Bond films where Q, the guy in the white coat, gives Bond these incredible weapons and tells him to be very careful with them and Bond dismisses this fearful silliness and then winds up destroying the weapon. Um, the guys, the strategic air command culture came out of the bomber culture of the Second World War. These guys risked their lives every single time they went into a plane to go bomb Germany. You know, I think that there was a 50% chance that you were going to get killed if you did your full tour of duty. And Curtis LeMay had this gung-ho notion that if we had to go to war with the Soviets, it was going to be all out. We had to go all out immediately. And anything less than that might lead to the destruction of the United States. He was sincere. He was patriotic. He trusted his men. And he trusted their discipline. And he didn't want any mechanism of any kind on his bombs or his missiles that might in any way prevent them from being used when he wanted to use them. Now, some of those concerns might be legitimate. Uh, when Thomas Power took over a sack after Curtis LeMay, he wrote a memo arguing against any of these switches that basically you'd have to put a code in to use the missile. Because he, his argument was, what if the Soviets you know, can mess around with a code they can dud all of our missiles. There were people who argued there should be a self-destruct mechanism on the missile so that if one of our missiles gets launched accidentally, someone in the control center can just push a button like they can at Vandenberg um, and you know, remotely destroy the missile. But then they were concerned, well, what if the Soviets get into that system? They can just destroy all of our missiles. Now, personally, I think that there is a balance between relying on people and relying on technology. Um, we had thousands of nuclear weapons in Europe under NATO command that had no locks on them, that had no coded switches, and Secretary of Defense McNamara found out and was absolutely appalled and terrified that uh, not just an American uh, serviceman, but a German, a Turk, French might, not French, I'm sorry about that, a Dutch might use one of these weapons. So the Strategic Air Command did get some initial revenge because they were forced in the 1970s to put these coded switches uh, that could control the launch of a missile. But for all the Minuteman missiles, 
the Minutemen all had the same code. And it was zero, 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 zero. I, I, it was a series of zeros. So if you really needed to launch it, these guys knew that they could, and they never did. Look, we could go on to all night, and I wish we could. And I want you all to come talk to Eric when you get him to sign copies of Command and Control. I agree with Senator Pryor. This is a great public service. I also want to say that, that those young airmen who are about my age uh, that came to talk in confidence, um, I had never uh, given their names to anybody. And when Eric started writing this book, he asked me if I would share their names. And first I said no. And then he assured me that he would n not jeopardize uh, where, because I had no idea where they were, or what they had done. And, and, and he was able to make contact with some. But the story that I will always remember was that one of the young airmen came to Eric who gave the message to me that he wanted me to make sure that I knew that when he came to talk about these safety issues, that he loved his country and that he loved being in the Air Force and he didn't want me to think he was unpatriotic. I thought he was a hero. I thought it took great courage. And Eric, thank you for writing this book. Thank you. <laughs>